And welcome back to The Breakfast uh, this morning. It's time for Off the Press. It's our quick uh, review of uh, the major stories making headlines across the country this morning. And we hope it's going to be a very, very interesting conversation with our guest, uh, Mr. Ezekiel Nyae Tok. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, sir. Good morning. Pleasure to be with you always. Interesting times across the country this morning. I'm hoping that we would uh, go through some of those very big stories um, in the papers. I wish I could call interesting times. I would rather say <laughs> challenging times than curious times. But anything but interesting. We'll see. We kick off with uh, the Nation newspapers this morning and see uh, as many of these stories that, as we can take um, and, uh, of course, share with you and get our guests to also comment on some of these stories. Um, of course, one of them here says uh, seven people have been held for armed robbery in uh, Abiola's home. Also, electricity consumers seek tariff reversal say the timing is not appropriate. Also, by election, Lagos APC picks candidates today. The above been in to politicians, rein in your thugs. Also on the Nation newspapers, PPMC fixed petrol price at 151.56. And it says the pump price may hit 162 naira per litre. And of course, in Edo State, police pledge security ahead of election. APC and PDP disagree. Abasaki condoles with Oshomole and is a more over crash. Um, a few other stories, the major stories this morning on the nation. Buhari, uh, the president, rather says corrupt middlemen behind rising food prices. It also say, says rather flood destroys 450,000 hectares of rice farm. How will prevent food scarcity by uh, the president? That's also on the Nation newspapers this morning. And the Ghana speaker raises hope of a truce with Nigeria. Um, these are the major stories that we can find on the Nation newspapers this morning. And over to our guest, uh, Mr. Nye, talk uh, quickly. Let's have your, your take. Um, the very first thing that hits me is that of um, the major headline. Uh, Buhari, talking about corruption, um, corrupt middlemen being behind the rising food prices. I, a lot of times, I just don't want to do conventional analyses because these are things we all know. But I just want to, like, you know, look behind and really start to think and interrogate certain happenings in the polity. Imagine that during the Kogi elections, the IGP told us that, you know, fake policemen were responsible for the mayhem and everything, the atrocities. And I asked myself, do we really understand the concept of people playing their roles? Do we really know that in a football pitch, you have the strikers, you have the midfield, you have the defense, you have the goalkeeper. When you find the striker in the 18, in his 18, you wonder who's going to score the goals. Now, government is actually a segmentation of roles and responsibilities. The citizens do what you call problem analysis, and then people are elected to do what is called solution Proffering. So when the IGP comes to do problem analysis and tell us that these are the people responsible, I'm asking myself, are we having a team of only goalkeepers and no strikers? Are, are we not the ones trying to bring the problems up and then IGP to provide the solution? What I expected the IGP to do was to brief us that this problem was caused by these people whom we have proactively, having gotten the intel, taking these decisions, and this was the result. As a matter of fact, he should do a post-mortem briefing on why the election was so smooth and so credible and so fair, and we tell us because their intel had spotted you know, private citizens that were so in police uniform and you were able to apprehend them and stop them. So we were able to mitigate that and it never got to be. But when you come to do a post-mortem and say, oh, the problem was as a result of 
people who sold fake uniforms. I'm like, excuse me? And that's exactly what I'm finding today. How can my president, the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, come to give me the breaking news that, oh, corrupt middlemen are behind rising food uh, prices? I'm like, wow, what a revelation. Thank you, Jesus. Okay? Mr. President, if he had this info, would have got him back to his cabinet, held major brainstorming sessions and said, look, the problem is this. I've been able to have this problem articulated and brought to me. What's the solution? I need to have it done. And in briefing us on why the food prices have come down, he would tell us how he realized that the middlemen were the cause of the problem and these were the steps he took and as a result, everything is fine. So let us start to understand what government is, yeah. the role of government, and the role of us citizens. We are to look for the problems that we have, articulate the problems that we have, make them available to our representatives in the National Assembly or in the House of Assembly, and let them be able to enact enabling laws that will address those challenges to the and that every state there is peace, every nation there is progress. Right. Unless we start to see government from that perspective, we will just be running in circles and then wondering how we have become the poverty capital of the world. Right. It let, just let, doesn't let, make sense to me. Let's quickly so, move to yes. the story on uh, electricity so, consumers uh, seeking a reversal on the tariff. Uh, it came as a, you, a, a huge it, shock it's to a lot all of Nigerians. The same line of reasoning, stories. Electricity tariff. I've said once before on this program, I believe, I, 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 as a private citizen, I feel it's my responsibility to see that the government works well. So I actually had opportunity of sitting down one-on-one -on -one with the, the, the chairman of um, NERC to really look, interrogate these issues. Number one, we can't run away from cost-reflective tariff. Nobody invests. You know, an investor is not, um, is not for that Christmas. He puts his money where he's going to make profit. But government is there to regulate, to modulate. Government is there to see to what extent it can defend the interest of the common man. And he does that through maybe subsidy, which could go both ways. Okay. For this class of people, this is what I want you to do for them. Or he says, I can't control you. So this food I cannot afford, I'm going to give you something direct. So that is going to mitigate the, the, the challenge so that let them, the businessman do his business. But when we come to electricity tariff, there are a lot of things I really can't understand. And the foundation is as clear as can be. Who are the operators? Are they the best? Are they the most technical? Are they the most competent? Are they the most endowed to do the work? When you carry a square peg and put in a round hole and start to wonder why the peg is not going in, the problem is not with the peg, the problem is with you. You don't need rockets, you don't need profit or record sense to know that. So we will continue to have problems within the electricity subsector. Today they will tell us uh, we've been able to give a subsidy of up to a trillion. Tomorrow they will say they are not being subsidized. The next day we wonder whether there's tax holiday or not. And we keep going round in circles. But the question is, what are the problems? Number one, if we've made a mistake, Americans say, cut your losses, we can reverse. It's going to be painful. But I had a friend who had an accident. And he didn't want his leg cut off. And they say, sir, if we don't cut this leg off, you're going to bleed to death. No, sorry, it wasn't. He said it was his arm. And they appealed to him. He doesn't have an arm today, but he has a life. So sometimes you get yourself in a situation right. where you must cut your losses. So the question is, in electricity subsector, unless it's run by competent people, we'll continue to have a problem, okay. number one. Number two, except the pricing is right, we will not have those who are real businessmen in the area take up that responsibility. All when right. you put the first and the second together, then you have to have a government that thinks more of results than of politics. 
Okay. When you have a government that thinks more of results than of politics, you are going to have a situation where we sit down, review the issues concerning our electricity, interrogate the processes, network with the people, the stakeholders, okay. and everybody will come to say, okay, this is the reasonable thing to do. Nigerians are not unreasonable. All right, let, let's, move to, let's move to the... They just want you to come clean with them. They just want to understand these processes and yeah. we'll be fine. Let's move to the Punch newspapers next. Um, of course, one of the lead stories and there then, um, has to do with uh, the maybe pump another. price of uh, uh, petrol. It says outrage as depot price hike may push petrol to 160 naira per litre. Small businesses will be hit hard, manufacturers warn. Um, uh, Nigerians are being taken for granted by this government, says uh, the NLC. Also, Benin monarch Mita Baseki Izeyamu says election is not do or die. Um, other stories we can find on the point this morning. Naira rebounds, exchanges for 420 Naira to the dollar. Speculators count losses. Mena asks Malami to review fraud charges against him. And also, Nigeria records 1.8 trillion Naira balance deficit in quarter two. Uh, FEC approves $3.1 billion automation project for customs. A few others this morning. Northern lawyers reject uh, MBA Splinter Group as police arrest suspect over invasion of Abiola's residence and theft. And uh, abductors of Ondo doctors reduce 100 million naira ransom, demand 6 million naira. Lead stories on the punch this morning. Uh, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, some, some, some stories jump out at me uh, immediately, and you have the fuel hike. You have the, the splinter group in the NBA, yeah. and you have the um, or, um, Edo Monarch, you know, the River and the, um, uh, the Oba of Benin. Now, let's start from the fuel hike. You know, this story of fuel hike, fuel hike, is deeper than this. How many of us understand, or how many of us don't know, because it's public knowledge, that the petroleum product that we have, if you refine it, you have as much as 4,000, a man actually said 6,000 derivatives from it if you refine the product. Number two, I cultivate cassava. I eat some. I take some to sell. What's my business with cost-reflective tariff on cassava? Whether I know I need to take some to eat. Why am I doing the business, even if it's not for me to have food in my, in my house to feed my children? We have oil. We keep watching the international market price of crude. How is that important to us when we are selling crude at, say, $45 or $50 and importing just one element of, 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 of the derivatives for twice, thrice, four times the amount that we are getting... Are we sitting down to do the calculations? You see, we run government that is not cerebral, and government is like business. It is only people who don't understand <laughs> what's going on that will say government has no, no, no business in business. That, that's, that's the most lame argument I've heard in my life. Government, after God, is the next most important institution. And any institution that does not run on certain prime principles what you may call statute of general application, best corporate practices, cannot be sustainable. This is not a quote that you say, wow. It's something you and I know. So take fuel, for instance. Why is it difficult for us to have refineries that work? So that, number one, we refine our product and get it cheap. Do you know that when you bring in products from outside, you talk in terms of the landing cost, which is really next to nothing. You talk of that uh, NPA charges, NIMASA charges, storage charges, this is charges, landing this is that, that. When you add all the plus, 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 which are not necessary if they were produced at home, you realize that something that should go for five naira is going for 50 naira. And you're asking yourself, why? How? If you do not have the product at home, it's understandable, yeah. but we have the product. So why can't we refine it? Why can't the refiner... Let me, a day will come 
in this country, when we have government that thinks of governance and not of politics, these are people who are going to think of the people and, of the, and not the election. A day will come. And for as long as we Nigerians keep running these commentaries without wanting to lift a finger and interrogate the process, we'll continue. But the time is going to come when a critical mass of Nigerians are going to say enough is enough. Come, let's stop and think. We can't continue this way. So coming back, you see this price of, you know, in December, there was the issue of, I think that it was in 2016, they started muting this idea of um, price modulation, you know, so that the price at home will be dependent on the price abroad. And then one of the first reviews they did was when the price abroad was coming down, we increased our pump price from about 84, 87 to about 120. I'm like, excuse me, I don't understand. <laughs> Has the price of crude gone up in the international market? The answer is no. So why is our pump price going up? Difficult to understand. As at today, why can't government be transparent enough to tell us the different costs that have been able to give us the pump price at 161 naira to a liter of petrol. What is the international crude, you know, price of, uh, international price of crude as of today? Please, somebody just do the maths. Let me you know, I had, I had parents that were not quite literate, so they sent me to school and they paid through their nose. So one of the things I can't do without is use my brain, at least to honor them. So can somebody just give me an intellectual dialogue on how we arrive on some of these um, prices, whether it's electricity, whether it is petrol, and for as long as we do not sit to interrogate the processes, for so long will they just keep swinging us left, right, and center? All right. That much about um, because of time. Yeah. Let, that much about um, the price of um, yeah. petrol. Let's let's do a few seconds then, on the Edo State story, <laughs> and then we move to the Guardian as quickly as possible. Let's do talk a little bit on um, Edo I, State. I wish, I wish I heard you. It seems network has played a game on me. Okay, I, I was saying let, let's do a quick one on uh, the story in Edo State, the above Benin um, uh, intervening and, of course, bringing uh, the two candidates together yesterday. The monarch, the monarch did what I believe that the monarch should do, but I don't think this is the, monarch, the, the, the problem of the monarch of Edo State. Yeah. The reason is simple. As a traditional ruler, the best he can do is an appeal, but there is somebody who can do something. And let me say this, even if it is the last thing I'll say on this program. I, I wish Mr. President would listen to me. A door state election is going to define the presidency of our president, President uh, Mohamed Buhari, Mohammed Buhari, Buhari. A door state, and I want this to be on record, is going to define his whole eight years. If a door goes bad, Endo is, going, Endo is going to go worse. And then 2023 is going to be a disaster. If Edo goes well, Ondo is going to be the better. And 2023 is going to be his crowning glory. What he should do, I've said this before and I say it again, two things. One, call the chairman of INEC. If I don't have free, fair, credible elections in Edo state, I'll remove you the next day. Two, call the IGP. If there's violence and all these problems in a Edo State, I'll remove you the next day, the two of you. Whatever you need, let me know. I don't want to hear anything. I don't want any stories. I want free, fair, credible elections. I want all the problems in Edo State to end today. Number two, INEC, let me give you a little hint as your president. Stop all rallies now. It affects APC, it affects PDP, it affects everything. From tomorrow, everything is town hall meetings. People sit down, you address them, you leave. You go to the next place, people sit down, you address the people. If you flout this, we will deal with you. All that right. stops the violence. All right, let, let's move on Brother, to the... Let's move on to the... Deal with me. Yeah, because yeah, of time, let, let's quickly move on to the Guardian newspapers. Uh, this morning, so we can also take a few stories from there before we uh, wrap up. There's so much, you know, and uh, 
Yeah. Um, I understand that the need to spread uh, our tentacles <coughs> as far as possible. Um, government okays $3 billion to automate customs and $26 billion naira for airports, NDLEA and others. Labor threatens to ground power sector over new tariff. Also, federal government makes 11 billion naira seizures from border closure in one year. Eight dine Kebi Kano ac um, Kano accident, sorry. And also, external reserves fall below threshold. It says we can't get firmer Naira with uh, Dithrin external reserves. Nigeria lags behind South Africa and Algeria in size per capita. Um, one or two others. Confusion as petrol marketers fixed price at 162 Naira a litre. Marketers blame government for chaos, say the government is toying with subsidy. Uh, the increase is unacceptable, House Minority Caucus declares. Um, all right, let, let's quickly start from, uh, from any of these stories uh, with the time we all have right, left. Um, Go ahead, please. The, the one that um, gladdens my heart, I would like to start with, is that of um, the three billion that's um, to be spent to automate customs. I think that it's very important that the customs don't continue with this um, so-called uh, manual inspection because when you talk in terms of ease of doing business, we are an import-dependent nation. And even apart from import, even in export, then you realize that even some of our, there's been stories of people who were trying to export yam and the yams were at the ports and, um, you know, Usually, maybe they had like a three-week span to be delivered. And by three weeks, they had not even left the port. And by the time they were delivered, eventually, they were as good as um, condemned. Why would that be, if not for the pressure of the, of, the, of the manpower at the port? So if we automate the, 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 the things coming in, it frees the people, makes the work a lot easier, and it makes the work also more thorough that will be able to check people declaring arms as foodstuff. You know, this proliferation of small arms and light weapons, a lot of them, uh, are, we've seen instances where they are disguised as a knocked down part of vehicles or something like that. I, I believe that proper automation as done in other countries will first discourage people from as much as thinking, because you see, you don't commit a crime when there's a high risk of being caught. But when there is that loose end and you be able to negotiate with the boys and, you know, so with the scanners, you don't really need to even go to containers. You're just in one group, you know, checking through uh, some monitors. So there's no money for you to meet and nobody knows when your own is going to be scheduled. So that is going to naturally discourage people who are bringing fake products or things that shouldn't be, you know, contraband products. And that is going to be good. So I, I commend Mr. President for that. When, when he does something good, I will say he's done something good. When he comes to tell us there's a problem, I'll say, please, sir, fix the problem. And then we go to labor. I've once had an, a near altercation with the labor leader on set on a national program, TV program, because I don't understand. When, when it has to be do with the, 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 the salaries of labor, the rights of labor, the world minimum wage, which I support them, they go to the street. That minimum wage is for the workers. How about when it has to do with issues that affect the generality of Nigerians? What is the attitude of labor? Oh, we issue a statement. I'm not a big fan of, um, uh, of, of, of um, strikes. Because when you, when you go on strike, you don't do the work, you eventually get paid, we are the losers at the end of the day. Uh, so also with protests. But there's, there are ways you, you can put pressure on the system in the larger interest of the people. At a time like this, I expect a well-coordinated plan of action from labor. So I'm still waiting to see what um, labor is um, planning to do. Then we, there's a major story of um, uh, uh, going below our threshold, yes. and that is a big problem. Our external reserves fall below threshold. I tried to um, find out one or two things about this story, and I realized that the CBN Act of um, 2007 has certain what they determine as threshold and 
the amount of money in the reserve that can fund, you know, imports or activities for a certain period of time. And uh, it seems to be that what we have in our external reserves cannot take us for more than two months, and that is dangerous. So the question is, what is the alternate? I'm not an economist. If it was housing, I would know what to do. But right now is an area that um, my my strength is weak. I must admit. All right, that, that's all the time we have this morning, Ezekiel. I told so I I um, don't know how much. Yeah, we're we're out of time uh, already. I thought as much. I thought as much. <laughs> Thank you so right. much. Um, let, let me let me add the last line. All right, Qu quickly, please. One second. I want to appeal to Nigerians to wake up. That's all. Thank you very much, Ezekiel Nyayetok, for sharing your views with us on these stories. And uh, looking forward to seeing you again. And that's all the time we have for Off the Press uh, this morning. It's also a wrap on The Breakfast. As always, your comments and observations are welcome via our, all our communication channels showing on your screen. We'll be back with more same time tomorrow here on PLOS TV Africa. Thank you for watching. Up next is News on the R in our news studio right after the break.